Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless all right i pledge my heart, I pledge my heart to the rainbow to the rainbow of the not so typical gay camp of the not so typical gay camp one camp one camp full of pride full of pride indivisible and equal rights for all. With affirmation and equal rights for all. Watch your heads. God gives a dire warning to anyone who would cause a child to sin, as we read in Matthew 18, 6 and 7. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come. A woe to that man by whom the offense comes. South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg sent a message to Vice President Mike Pence on Sunday saying his identity as a gay man has brought him closer to God. The 2020 Democratic presidential hopeful spoke to members of the Victory Fund, an LGBTQ political action committee. Buttigieg, who is married to a man, criticized Pence for his stances on gay marriage. Buddha Judge also said Pence's problem is not with him, but with a higher power. I can tell you that if me being gay was a choice, it was a choice that was made far, far above my pay grade. And that's the thing I wish the Mike Pence's of the world would understand. That if you've got a problem with who I am, your problem is not with me. Your quarrel, sir, is with my creator. Homosexuality is strongly condemned in the Bible. Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50. Look. This was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. What was this prideful abomination committed before God? The answer is found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 18.22 You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. God gives mankind a dire warning for the acts of homosexuality in 2 Peter 2.6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. God also offers forgiveness to those who are living a life of homosexuality as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What does it mean to be a child of God? 1 John 3.10 explains what it means to be a child of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. The life of a child of God will be completely different from the life of the unsaved. A child of God has a desire to live in a way that pleases the Heavenly Father, as we read in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Many people wrongly believe that everyone is a child of God. The Bible teaches us this is not true. We can only become His children when we believe in the name of Jesus Christ, as we read in John 1.12. But as many as received Him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 describes what happens when we are born again into the family of God through faith in Jesus. Therefore, 
If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus taught that becoming children of God means we must experience a new birth, as we read in John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A child of God is no longer a child of the devil, and God sets about transforming his children through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we read in Romans 8.13 and 14. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. If we do not begin to look like our Heavenly Father in word, desire, and action, we are most likely not really His, as we read in 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. Human beings were created to live as children of God. Sin marred that purpose and broke that bond with Him. Christ restores us to that original relationship. For all eternity, the sons and daughters of God will worship Him as one united family, as we read in Revelation 7, 9, and 10. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. A child of God lives for Him on earth, and eagerly awaits a future with Him in heaven, as we read in Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Soon a man known as the Antichrist will step onto the world stage. Three and a half years after he makes his appearance and declares himself to be God inside the soon-to-be-rebuilt Jewish temple, he will require all peoples of the earth to take his mark, showing their allegiance to him, as we read in Revelation 13, 16-18. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, his number is 666. In order for the Antichrist to control buying and selling, there must be a cashless society. Are we seeing any evidence of a cashless society today? President Biden signed an executive order today directing the federal government to come up with a plan to regulate cryptocurrencies. The move follows what the Biden administration is calling the, quote, explosive growth of digital assets in recent years. Under the order, the government will coordinate efforts with financial regulators to get a better understanding of the risks and benefits of cryptocurrencies. The directive also calls for the exploration and consideration of creating a digital form of the U.S. dollar. Events are happening faster than we can process them, yet nothing startles or amazes us much anymore. In the time of the end, the book of Daniel prophesied that knowledge would increase. Daniel 12.4 But you, Daniel... Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Knowledge had to increase for future prophecy to be fulfilled. The biblical knowledge we have today is because of the increase in technology. There are many prophecies in Daniel's time that could not come to fulfillment because the technology had not yet been invented. That is why Daniel was told to shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. In our time, the time of the end, we are witnessing the technology that will bring about the end of days, climaxing in the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Knowledge is increasing rapidly in accordance with Daniel's prophecy. And we are seeing an unsaved world rushing headlong into accepting the mark of the beast, and they don't even know it. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. 
All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18-20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. It's a battle that's been brewing in Bremerton for a long time. This is going to be the seventh football season, so yeah, seven, about seven years. Seven years since Joe Kennedy coached football at Bremerton High School. When he first got the job, he says his work routine involved a prayer at the 50-yard line after the game. God, I'm going to give you the glory after every game, win or lose. He says that was his reason, and soon he wasn't the only one taking a moment midfield. I had a couple players that said, you know, can I come out? And I said, absolutely. It's America. It's free country. But some Bremerton residents, like Paul Peterson, did not like it. It's a team. And if, if one or two or five people decide not to come out to the 50-yard line to pray with the, with the coach, that could be construed or misconstrued as being you don't want to be part of the team. The school district told Kennedy to stop and to pray separately from students. The district and Kennedy could not agree. He was fired and he filed a lawsuit. The former coach, Joe Kennedy, argues that no one should be fired from their job for simply being a person of faith in public. But representatives for Bremerton School District say this case is about a coach violating the religious freedom of public high school students. It's a very dangerous day in America to think of all the school children across this country where schools are supposed to welcome children feeling alienated and potentially ostracized if they don't pray to play. Rachel Lazar is representing the Bremerton School District. Jeremy Dice is representing Kennedy. Look, what's at stake in this case is very simple. It's whether or not coach can take a knee in silent prayer by himself for 15 to 30 seconds and what that's going to mean for every public school teacher and coach across the nation. Now the fight that started on this field will soon make it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3, 1 Corinthians 12.26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Matthew 5.10-12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. In the Florida panhandle this morning, a raging wildfire has burned more than 33,000 acres. The Bertha Swamp Road fire is 20% contained. It's one of three wildfires that have destroyed two homes and damaged 12 others. Manuel Bajorca shows us what is fueling the unusual fires in northern Florida. I was telling my husband, I'm not going in the house. And of course, I get here and I change my mind. We walk through what's left of Paul and Lori Schumann's home. Scorched heirlooms and burnt rubble are all that remain. The only thing I've actually been able to think, I can't stop thinking about for the past four days is my dog. That's what's, that hurts the worst. Every time I think about her trapped in this house. Across the panhandle, tens of thousands of acres have been scorched so far, fueled by a massive swath of debris. Nikki Freed is Florida's agriculture commissioner. So here we are four years almost after Hurricane Michael, and would you say that we are still dealing with the impacts? Absolutely. That's because remnants of Hurricane Michael's wrath in 2018 are amplifying this new problem. When you have 2.8 million acres of cut trees um, and broken trees, it is very hard to clean up the area. And why this area is now so prone to potential fires is because the canopy that used to be from all the timber trees used to help keep everything a little bit more moist on the ground. When there is no canopy, it is just becoming drier and drier, uh, which is just fuel for, for these types of fires. For the Schumanns, who also lost their home to Hurricane Michael, it's another disaster, another time to rebuild. Yes, we lost. And we'll deal with it. We'll get through this. We'll rebuild again somewhere. It won't be here.
North Korea is stepping up its challenge to the U.S. in Asia. American officials say Kim Jong-un's regime has been test firing components of a new intercontinental ballistic missile. The country has ramped up its missile testing since the beginning of the year. Elizabeth Palmer has more. North Korea had said the launches, two in the past two weeks, were to help develop satellites. But U.S. intelligence believes they were really to test components for a much larger weapon. The gigantic Hwasong-17 rolled out in a military parade back in 2020, but as far as anyone knows, never actually fired. It's an intercontinental ballistic missile, and if it works, designed to reach anywhere in the continental United States. North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un, today appeared at a space launch pad and announced he's also going to speed up the development of military satellites. Negotiations between Kim Jong-un and former President Trump in 2018 and 19 collapsed with no deal to curb North Korea's weapons program. The Biden administration has said it is willing to meet with North Korea any time, but hasn't offered a concrete proposal to get talks underway. Meanwhile, in just the first 10 weeks of this year, Western analysts think that North Korea has manufactured enough nuclear material for one or even two more atomic bombs. A recent Reuters poll found that 80 percent of Americans want the U.S. to stop buying Russian oil. President Biden has obliged. He announced Tuesday that steps would be taken to ban Russian oil imports into the United States. Reuters also found that 74 percent of Americans want the U.S. and NATO to set up a no-fly zone over Ukrainian skies. During his visit to Brussels, Secretary of State Antony Blinken rejected that idea. The only way to actually implement something like a no-fly zone uh, is to send NATO planes into Ukrainian airspace and to shoot down Russian planes. And that uh, could lead to a full-fledged war um, in, uh, in Europe. President Biden has been clear that we uh, are not going to get into a war with Russia. But Ukrainian President Zelensky says a no-fly zone is needed to defend freedom and save lives. We are this zone of freedom. And when the limits of uh, rights and freedoms are being violated and stepped on, then you have to protect us because we will come first, you will come second, because the more this beast will eat, he wants more, more and more. So if President Biden eventually acquiesces to that request, how likely is it that a no-fly zone could lead to a dangerous escalation of the conflict, perhaps even cause Putin to use tactical battlefield nuclear weapons? Well, joining us is Jason Castillo. He's director of the National Security Affairs Program at the George Bush School of Government at Texas A&M. How likely is it that Putin will resort to using nukes in Ukraine? Well, I think right now it's a low probability event, but I'm a little, I'm a little disturbed that uh, you have people calling for a no-fly zone, uh, even a partial no-fly zone, whatever that means. To be clear, a no-fly zone means that we would be preventing Russian planes from flying over Ukraine, which means we would be shooting them down. Uh, I bring your attention back to no-fly zones over uh, Kosovo in 1999, uh, Iraq uh, in 2003. Uh, a no-fly zone means that the U.S. and Russian forces would be fighting. And I think the scenario that worries most of us is that uh, Russia views Ukraine as a very high-stakes uh, contest. And if we enforce a no-fly zone, if we get into a conventional conflict with Russia, uh, there's a good chance that because it's high stakes, they will risk using nuclear weapons. And they could do it in two ways. Uh, and, and by the way, this is uh, very similar to NATO's playbook or its strategy of flexible response during the Cold War. When you're losing conventionally, you can use low-yield nuclear weapons to signal your resolve in a demonstration to show that uh, this has to stop and you're willing to escalate further. Uh, more likely and more trou troubling, I think Russia might use low-yield nuclear weapons not as a demonstration, but to change the balance of power on the conventional battlefield, to offset some of our conventional advantages and put us in a bad spot. Uh, once that happens, we don't have any good historical evidence to rely on to suggest uh, how things stop in fact, my own view is that once nuclear weapons are used, uh, things are likely to get out of control. If he were to use nuclear weapons uh, and he resorted to, say, using battlefield tactical nukes, 
what would that look like? I mean, my uh, my thought on that is, well, wouldn't the fallout from that go into Russia and actually hurt and harm Russian people as well? Let's use a baseline. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were about 15 to 20 kilotons. Uh, some of our strategic nuclear weapons have yields that are much higher, uh, or let's say 300 kilotons without giving exact numbers. These low yield weapons, and again, we had a similar doctrine. We we're talking about one, two, five, ten 10 kilotons, and you can burst them in the air to reduce fallout. And the effects, because they're low yield, would be more local than they would be blowing back on Russia. Uh, using strategic nuclear weapons would cause fallout and cause, uh, uh, would, would be detrimental to us and the Russians. But this is a way to try to make them more usable on the battlefield. He has uh, his nuclear forces on combat ready alert. So do you think that's just saber rattling or are we really under a threat of limited nuclear warfare here? Well, I think right now it's a low probability event. And I think the administration understands that the red line here is Ukraine. And that's why they're reluctant to, to do impose a no-fly zone and get involved in the conflict. Uh, interestingly enough, I think NATO understood this, and this is why Ukraine was not put into NATO to begin with, because they understood that the Russians cared greatly about, about Ukraine. Uh, so I think the, the probability of a nuclear exchange is very low. But if the conflict continues and NATO gets involved, and NATO forces are quite good, especially NATO air power, that could push Putin against the walls. What about uh, Poland sending these MiGs uh, to Germany uh, for use uh, by the Ukrainians? Yeah, that has the potential to escalate. The Russian military has complained that Ukrainian air forces are landing in Romania and then flying back over to do combat missions over Ukraine. It's not a stretch to see Russian military officials complaining about airframes coming in from Poland. Uh, this is an interesting case because, again, I think the administration was reluctant to do it, but the polls came out in public and said, this is something we want to do, almost forcing our hand. Um, in, in an interesting little tidbit that a colleague of mine reminded me of recently is that in 2009, the Russians ran an exercise where uh, called Zapad 2009, and in that exercise, uh, it, it envisioned a conflict with NATO and Russia practice using nuclear weapons against Warsaw. A deal to restore the 2015 Iran nuclear deal is close at hand. Only some final sticking points are left to negotiate prior to completion. Joining us with some insights on this is Benham Ben Talablu. He's senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. In their haste to reach a deal, are the Europeans and Americans making too many concessions? What are the Iranians giving? Anything? It seems like this is not merely a restoration or, or a resurrection of what was by 2015 standards a fatally flawed deal, but kind of quickly shaping up to be based on what some are alleging uh, since the past year of indirect talks, a less for more or a more for less, depending on whose position you are, of course. Uh, the Iranians are not only insisting on going back to the sanctions that were waived by the 2015 nuclear deal, but they're actually asking for most of the Trump era sanctions, which built on top of those penalties to be removed again. And ultimately on their own side, they're saying they won't concede more on the nuclear front. So uh, the US will have to be paying more for less timed restrictions on the clock, which is again, in my view, a uh, strategic mistake on steroids. Iranian leaders often refer to the United States as the great Satan. There's an old adage that the devil is in the details. So share some specifics here. What in the devil's going on? The uh, enmity of the Islamic Republic has been almost permanent ever since the Islamic Republic came into existence 43 years ago. They ideologically and politically have harbored this enmity against the United States of America, to which they have called the label you mentioned, the Great Satan. Now what they're trying to do is they're trying to get as much cash and sanctions relief as they can up front while keeping most of their nuclear program intact to be able to threaten not just this administration, but any future administration, which may revert to pressure. Uh, you can call it Iran's quest for a financial and nuclear snapback. Israel and some U.S. officials say this agreement would give Iran a quicker breakout time. They could enrich enough uranium to build a nuclear bomb within six to nine months instead of a full year. Your thoughts on that, Ben? Well, again, it's it's more proof that uh, Washington and, and uh, its, its diplomatic partners on the P5 plus one who support this are proving to the Islamic Republic that they're willing to settle for less, 
uh, the Islamic Republic literally came out a few days ago and said that they don't believe in America's plan B. They don't believe America has another alternative track or, or uh, to put it differently, a pressure track. So that's why the Islamic Republic can continue to extort uh, the U.S. indirectly at, at these negotiations and get changes based on real nuclear facts on the ground, real advancements the Islamic Republic has made over the past year, year and a half, which in terms of knowledge are irreversible, no matter the time uh, restrictions that exist within the deal. President Biden says the renewed agreement would put Iran's nuclear program back in a box. So, Ben, is it a nuclear Pandora's box? Where is this all heading? You know, this is a, really a house of cards here. We could, we could come up with analogies all day. Uh, but ultimately, I think one thing is very clear, that the strategic reason the Biden administration wants this is to be able to buy time, buy time using more money to actually get less time on the clock, to pivot out of the region, to focus on other issues. Uh, but the world, per the Ukraine crisis, has proven that it's not stovepipe like that, that the world is actually much more interconnected, that Iran actually has, for lack of a better word, lawyers on the P5 plus one, the Russians and the Chinese, people who stand to benefit uh, by a, a new fatally flawed deal coming to the fore again. So ultimately, this would be a self-defeating move to pay more, to get less time on the clock, to make this or a future administration uh, have to deal with a much larger, much more dangerous nuclear program, one that the Iranians would be in more control of and could dangle in front of us at a time of their choosing. Joining me now, Israel's 17th permanent representative to the United Nations, Ambassador Danny Danone. Ambassador, thank you for being with us. Let's get right to it. If the deal on the table right now happens, what would be most devastating about it? Brian, that would be bad news for Israel, bad news for the Middle East and for the American people. President Biden said that the new deal will be longer and stronger. What we are seeing is a very weak deal that will be shorter than the one that was signed in 2015. We should be all be very worried about it. You know, while we all pay attention to Ukraine, we have to also pay attention to Vienna, where the U.S. and other democracies are uh, running into signing this bad agreement. And if you look back at 2015, Israel was against the agreement back then because of its flaws. So today you still have the same flaws of the 2015 agreement, basically no inspections of the sites. Mm. They will continue the ballistic missile test. But above that, today they are already enriched uranium to the level of 60%. And we know that if we disagree agreement, they will be able to achieve nuclear capabilities mm -hmm. within three years. There's a nuclear problem with this. There's a money problem as well. If Iran gets money, what are they going to do with it? As of today, with the sanctions, Iran is spending $10 billion on their proxies, promoting terrorism in Syria, Lebanon, the Gaza Strip. They, they spread chaos and, uh, and violence all over the Middle East, Middle East. Imagine what they will do without the sanctions. And, and you know what, you know, three chief negotiators of the U.S. decided to resign because they felt, they felt that actually the U.S. is not negotiating. Everybody is appeasing the Iranians, allowing them to put more demands. And even now they are talking about lifting sanctions yeah. from the leadership of the Iranians and even the revolutionary guard of Iran. Ambassador, quickly, you want to tear this deal up. What do you want to see in its place? So we want to see crippling sanctions and real inspections, because the end goal of the Iranians is to have a, a nuclear bomb. We saw in the last few days when you have a, a nation threatening to use nuclear capabilities. Can you imagine, Brian, that in, in five years, the Iranians will threat Israel, the U.S., of using nuclear capabilities? So we want a stronger agreement with sanctions that will actually prevent them from getting to that point. The stakes here are very high. Ambassador, we thank you for bringing your perspective to it. Here is an interesting headline out of Fox News. Saving Ukraine. Looking for a world leader to stand up. The world has rallied behind the Churchillian figure of Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky for his bravery and resilience in the defense of his country. Zelensky, in his speeches, has thrown down the gauntlet to world leaders by telling them to stand up and do more to help is the Antichrist, ready to make his appearance on the world stage? As the world continues to spiral out of control, a man, I believe, who is alive and well today, will soon come on the world scene, seeming to have all the answers, and he will bring a false peace to the nations of the world. Three and a half years after this man comes on the world scene, 
his true intentions will become known. He will bring war the likes of this planet has never seen. And with war will come famine, pestilence, and death. The Bible refers to him as the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. What do we know about the Antichrist? The Antichrist has many names. The King of Fierce Countenance, the Prince who is to come, the Beast, the Son of Perdition, the Worthless Shepherd, the Man of Sin, the Lawless One. The first sealed judgment in the book of Revelation is the releasing of the Antichrist upon the earth. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The Antichrist will be evil, yet appear as a savior. He will be outspoken and have great speaking ability. He will have a fierce countenance. The Antichrist will be extremely proud. He will not desire women. He will be a military genius. The Antichrist will be mortally wounded. He will be indwelt by Satan. He will come from a revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will control a one world government. He will control a one world religion. He will control a one world monetary system known as the mark of the beast. It is evident that planet earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven year tribulation in which the inhabitants of planet earth who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. When the fifth seal is broken, those who have been slain for the word of God and their testimony will be given white robes and told to rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. When the sixth seal is broken, there will be a great earthquake. The sun will become black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon like blood, and the stars of heaven will fall to the earth. When the seventh seal is broken, there will be silence in heaven for about a half an hour. After seven seals are opened, seven trumpets are blown. When the first angel sounds, vegetation is struck. Hail and fire mingled with blood will be thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees and all the green grass will be burned up. When the second angel sounds, the seas are struck. Something like a great mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea, which seems to be a meteor causing a third of the sea to become blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea to die, and a third of the ships to be destroyed. When the third angel sounds, the waters are struck. A great star falls from heaven, burning like a torch on the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters become Wormwood, and many men will die from the water, because it will be made poisonous. When the fourth angel sounds, the heavens are struck. A third of the sun is struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them are darkened. A third of the day will not shine, and likewise the night. When the fifth angel sounds, Satan is cast down from heaven to release demons from the bottomless pit to torment those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads for five months. When the sixth angel sounds, a demonic army numbering 200 million will kill a third of mankind. Four billion people have now died at this time, equaling half of the world's population. When the seventh angel sounds, the temple of God is opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant is seen in his temple, and there are lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. 
After seven trumpets have sounded, seven bowls are poured out. When the first angel pours out his bowl, a foul and loathsome sore will come upon the men who have the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. When the second angel pours out his bowl on the sea, it will become blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea will die. When the third angel pours out his bowl, the rivers and springs of water will become blood. When the fourth angel pours out his bowl on the sun, power is given to him to scorch men with fire, and men are scorched with great heat. When the fifth angel pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast, his kingdom becomes full of darkness, and they will gnaw their tongues because of the pain. When the sixth angel pours out his bowl, it results in the Euphrates River being dried up and the armies of the Antichrist being gathered together to wage the battle of Armageddon. When the seventh angel pours out his bowl, a loud voice comes out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. A devastating earthquake flattening everything on planet earth followed by giant hailstones weighing 100 pounds each completes the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments. God's judgment against this wicked and unrepentant world will leave no doubt as to his wrath against sin. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36:27 and James 2:26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does His kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8-9 declares, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist 
call people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. through But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14:17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!